Each Lent, we do a homily series on topics relevant to the big questions in life. This year's homily series, which starts today, will be centered around the human search for meaning and purpose, addressing big questions such as, what do I seek? Who am I? Why a God? What's the significance of my life, my story? Who is Jesus and why should he matter to me? Am I saved? Will there be an afterlife? And why the need for a church? I'll be using as my primary source a book called The Search, written by Chris Stefanik and his team, which has a ton of really great research and data and just really good thought in it. The book also became an excellent video series that he produced. Uh, and um, I, I called Chris Stefanik to get permission to um, use some of his book in this homily series, and he gave me permission to do it only on the condition that um, after I write all the homilies, he gives those, he, I have to send those to him so he can send them to other priests. So, okay, I can do that, yeah. So, right, I'm writing away. But I'm using a lot of his, obviously it's a truncated version, right, because there's more in the book, and I have to put my own touch upon it in order to make it a homily. But here's my deal. It's my hope that whether it is the homily series, which is being recorded at our live stream mass, it's 11 o'clock, so it's always then out on our YouTube channel, our parish YouTube channel, or the video series, which is available to everyone on form.org. A lot of us use form.org. Or the book, which we gave out as a gift last year. I hope some of you read it. My hope is, is that addressing some of these big life issues questions will help, first of all, you who are, who are sitting in a pew in a church on a Sunday, you know, and all over the place in stages of, of your spiritual life. Some really in it, maybe some barely hanging on and a lot of in between. But also, I pray that you share these messages with people that you know and love and believe would benefit from them, but are not in a church and not in a community of believers. Maybe they're folks who are struggling with their faith in God or their faith in themselves and their relevance or their place in this world and the meaning, the purpose in their life. I hope that you'll share them. You can send them the homily series or connect them to the video series or give them the book. So let's begin with, what do you seek? In today's first reading from the First Corinthians 15, St. Paul asks this big, bold question about life and death. He says, he starts with, Brothers and sisters, when this which is incorruptible clothes itself with incorruptibility, and this which is mortal clothes itself with immortality, then the words that are written shall come about. Death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Where, O oh death, is your sting? My friends, all of you are going to die. And what a horrible start to this homily series. <laughs> We're all going to die. No one gets out of this life alive. If you've ever walked through a cemetery, you see rows and rows of tombstones. Everyone who has ever lived has this in common, rich or poor. Everyone ends up six feet under a slab of granite, a tombstone. Carved into each tombstone are two sets of dates. Start date and an end date. The part we often overlook when we look at these two dates is the little thing between the start and the end date. The dash. The dash is your life. 
So what do you want from your dash? Some people live their entire lives distracted by passing things and never really pause to ask the big questions. What is this all about? What do I want out of my dash? What am I looking for in my life? Maybe it's power. You want to be the boss. You don't want to spend your life working for other people's dreams. Okay. Maybe it's money. A lot of people think that if they have money, then they'll be content. The house, the car, the right zeros in their bank account, the retirement fund. Work and work to gain them, and you will be satisfied. Maybe it's some sense of personal achievement. Spend your life achieving your personal goals. You'll be happy. Maybe it's fitness. Get that chiseled body you've always dreamed about. This will make you feel better about yourself and gain you the self-worth you've been looking for all your life and the admiration of others. Maybe it's the next adrenaline rush. Certainly this will make you feel alive. How about pleasure? That will get you what you're really looking for, right? Maybe you just want to make a difference. That'll be the sign that you matter. Listen, there's nothing wrong with money or exercise or skydiving or the noble dreams of providing for your family. This is good stuff. However, no matter what we are looking for in our lives, there is one common denominator in all of them. We all want to be happy. Long before Jesus, Aristotle talked about happiness as the end of every action. It is the thing we were made for. It is our goal to be happy. So what will make us happy? The whole world is proming, promising us happiness. Everywhere you look, advertisers and entertainment industry are offering us personal comfort and fulfillment. If we would just buy this or that product or have this or that experience, achieve the dreams they want to sell us that we look at on our social media hours upon hours a day. Ever wonder why you're there? Here's the problem. So often we dream too small. And we confuse passing pleasures, distractions, and brief satisfactions with the fundamental happiness we were made for. Which begs the question, or a second question, how long do you want to be happy? A couple of minutes, a few times a day, an entire day, a year, a lifetime? For eternity? We all recognize that we have appetites in this life. And some of those appetites we can satisfy pretty easily. We're hungry, we eat, we're satisfied. We're thirsty, we drink, we're satisfied. We want to achieve something, we accomplish it, we're satisfied. But as we go through each day, we have this existential sense that all the eating, drinking, and productivity in the world won't fill us completely. We all know what it's like to have a great meal and a great conversation. But these experiences fade away. How many medals and awards and acolytes do we have to collect before we are finally content? You see, at our core, we hunger for more. So if we really want to get serious with this question, what do I seek? I think we have to ask ourselves, if you could be happy forever, would you turn that down? Now, this might mean delaying certain pleasures and temporary satisfactions. 
along the way toward being happy forever. But wouldn't the sacrifice be worth it? In fact, doesn't the sacrifices of some of the things we make in this life make what we sacrifice for all the more meaningful? And don't they also make us all the more aware of what is really important to us in this life and thus enhance all the other parts of our lives? Now we're getting somewhere. Here's the bottom line. No matter how much we try to fill up our lives with the stuff of this world, there always seems to be the gaping hole within us. Reminding us that there is still more to our lives. There's still more room in us for something more than what we can gain simply on our own or even with a whole bunch of other people and other life experiences. Follow this. In the United States today, 20 to 25 percent of us are walking around every day suffering inside. Different forms of mental and emotional illness or types of anxiety or depression. Almost one out of every five persons in the United States has a pervasive level of anxiety that they struggle with every day. We live life at such a frantic pace, running from day to day and each day filled with so many tasks and expectations, deadlines and duties, all the while trying to chase down the next thing that we have set on our hearts to become the persons we want to become but never seem to realize on our own or even with a host of other people. For instance, we will be happy when we get out of the house and on our own as an adult. Or when we gain that position on a team, that degree or that career, that friend or husband or wife that body we desire, optimal health, or the praise of others. In psychology, this disorder is known as destination addiction. Someday, when I get this one thing, whatever the one thing is, then I will be happy. But then, as soon as we get that one thing, we realize we still want, need, crave more. We are restless. It is endless. Maybe, just maybe, life and our happiness isn't so much about the next thing. Maybe we first must find the meaning and purpose of our lives. Then we will know what to pursue and not pursue. And we will know what to do with our lives. As we live our meaning and purpose, we will find fulfillment. We will know, in fact, a deep, sustainable happiness that will carry us through not just the ups in life, but also the downs of life. And not just spite the downs, but because of them and through them. Who doesn't want that? I got to say something about religion. And as we begin this homily series. Religion. At some point in many people's lives, they might turn to religion, or that now nebulous word that's thrown around a lot, spirituality, for the meaning of their lives and in their search for answers. A growing number of younger people today, particularly Generation X, there are a lot of our young parents, and Gen Zers, they're the ones in school. They are now, sociologists tell us, the most anxious and depressed generation in the history of the United States. In, in modern history, the last couple hundred years. They're also part of what sociologists call the growing phenomenon called nuns. Nuns. N-O-N-E-S who when asked about their religious affiliation, they mark none, or they say none. When it comes to religion, these nuns, we're told, are the least religious generation in the history of the United States. 
Generation X, and now they're raising the next generation, Gen Zers, who sociologist says if something doesn't interrupt that, that generation, once they're adults and remain as adults, less than 10% of them will be religious, will even believe in God. Many of these nuns from these two younger generations say that religion has nothing to offer them. And then they follow up with offering up a host of reasons why they are not religious. And then, okay, naturally, it under, it's understandable, they then look for happiness in all kinds of other places, in themselves, in people, in pursuits. Yet, what we're seeing is that many of them are coming up empty, restless, unable to settle down, unable to commit, continually searching for a purpose in their life, or simply not searching and merely living their life from one day of existence to the next, disappointed that life doesn't offer more. Maybe even thinking there isn't more to life. No wonder they are the most anxious and depressed generation in humanity, in humanity today. Did you just make the connection there? What's missing? It's interesting. And I'll end with this today. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we see in John's Gospel, chapter 1, two young men ask Jesus, Where are you staying? And Jesus responds, come and see. So they do. They don't know who Jesus is, and they don't know where he's going, and they don't know how this is going to affect their lives. Nevertheless, they allow what we all have, that deep-seated desire for more to lead them in their search for meaning and purpose. As they look to Jesus, they get the sense that this Man, Jesus, can give them the answers and the happiness they seek. So they follow him. And they become two of the first disciples. And Jesus gives them their identity and mission in this life. And they become part of an ever ancient and ever new religion, a movement of seekers who allow the questions to lead them to the answer. And then that literally changed the world. What do you seek? What do you seek? Are you willing, no matter your age, no matter your state in life, no matter what you consider about yourself as a Christian, to come and see? That in, Indeed, there is more to your life than you're currently living. More to your faith than you're currently living. More than you ever know, have known up to this point in your life. More than you could ever imagine and dream you could live your life. Well then, take the next step. Put one foot in front of the other. And embark on the great adventure of the search. One day, you will come to realize that the one thing you are searching for, this one thing, this one person, has been searching for you. And when you slow down long enough to let yourself stay with him, you will find everything you have ever been looking for and never even in your wildest dreams thought was possible. So as we enter into this Lenten season, I hope that this Lenten season is a season for you to search. And not just for you, right? I hope that you'll take this search, whether it's the homily series or the video series or the book, and you'll share it with people out there who you know are searching in all other places other than in God. Or maybe you've just given up the search entirely 
and just live what is being dealt to them day to day. I hope that you love them enough to invite them to the search. Maybe it's inviting them into the walls of a church. And maybe they will laugh it off and say, I would never darken the walls of a church. Or give me a hard hat, right? Because the roof will fall down. Fine. Then send them the homily series or the video series or the book. But just remember this. A homily, a video, a book, it's all just information unless you actually embark on the search and find what it is that you're looking for. Who you're looking for.